I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute. Good evening and welcome to the third in a series of Manhattan Institute debates focusing on the important issues of this election year. Our topic for this evening, should the United States federal government continue to subsidize the development and production of renewable energy resources? I'm Howard Husick, Vice President for Policy Research here at the Institute. Our two previous debate events uh, were the February debate between Paul Starr of Princeton University and Ovik Roy of our own Center for Medical Progress on the merits and future of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, and our April debate on the extent and importance of income inequality in the United States, featuring former chief economist to Vice President Biden, Jared Bernstein, and Scott Winship of the Brookings Institution. Questions concerning the future both of those, by the way, are available to be viewed online at the Manhattan Institute's website. Questions concerning the future of American energy and what role, if any, the federal government should play in shaping that future have been front and center in our national political discourse at least since the OPEC oil embargo of 1973, which gave rise to the notion of energy independence as an important national goal. In the wake of concern over potential climate change and its possible link to the use of fossil fuels, however, the character of that conversation has changed to include the goal not just of reliable energy supply, but the use of those energy forms which are said to hold the promise of minimizing negative environmental side effects. The Obama administration in particular has demonstrated a strong commitment to the development of new renewable energy forms including solar and wind energy, pledging $27 million, $27 billion, there are no million dollar programs in Washington, $27 billion to renewable energy research and development, for instance, in the 2009 stimulus bill alone. Speaking in Cleveland last week, the President pledged to double down on such efforts should he be reelected, and supporters of such policies view these investments in solar and wind power as laying the foundations for a flourishing renewable energy industry, both creating new jobs and protecting against climate change. Yet critics of government support for the green energy sector argue that such subsidies are oversold, that the green uh, investments distort the energy market and divert capital from more conventional ener energy resources, which are themselves becoming cleaner. They also worry about government investment becoming wasteful and politicized, as some have seen as in the case of the much-discussed Solyndra bankruptcy uh, of the solar energy firm in California. Our speakers tonight will go beyond such specific examples, however, to discuss the core issue. Are taxpayer-funded subsidies and investments in so-called green jobs and renewable energy industries justified? Arguing in favor of government support, will be Gernot Wagner, economist at the Environmental Defense Fund and the author of But Will the Planet Notice? How Smart Economics Could Save the World. I should note that that's for sale uh, in the back of the room, uh, and I'm sure that uh, Mr. Wagner, Dr. Wagner will autograph it for you at the end of the evening. In opposition will be Robert Bryce, senior fellow in the Manhattan Institute Center for Energy Policy and the Environment and the author of his own book, also at the back table, Power Hungry, the myth of green jobs, and the real fuels of the future. Their full biographies are included in your program. Our format will be as follows. Uh, Gernot Wagner will speak, approximately, uh, will speak approximately for 12 minutes. Actually, Robert Bryce will speak first for approximately 12 minutes, followed by Gernot Wagner. Each speaker will then be given three minutes to rebut their opponent's position, followed by a period of moderated discussion. Uh, the remainder of the hour will be a question and answer session uh, from the audience, 
and we'll conclude with brief remarks from each of our speakers. We begin with Robert Bryce. Thank you. The government should not subsidize green jobs and the deployment of, and or the deployment of renewable energy. Government does not exist to create jobs. The role of government in the marketplace is to assure free, fair, and open markets. When it comes to energy policy, the government should not be subsidizing one form of energy at the expense of another. It should not subsidize renewable energy. Instead, it should have a laser-like focus on assuring that energy supplies are cheap, abundant, and reliable in that order. To do so otherwise imposes a regressive tax on the people who can afford it least. If the government is going to subsidize renewable or alternative energy forms, it should be do doing so by funding research and development into those forms of energy. And uh, I hesitate to, to correct Howard, but I will in this case because it's an important point. He, he mentioned $27 billion approximately in funding. It was for deployment of renewables, not for R&D. And that is a key point that I'll come back to in just a moment. Four points then uh, 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 to bolster my position. First, we have a definitional problem. Second, the issue of green jobs. Green jobs either do, do not exist or they are simply too expensive. Third, the subsidies for green jobs are merely fattening corporate profits and not driving innovation. And finally, the U.S. is dramatically cutting CO2. After all, that is what ultimately is the, the issue here. It is not about creating jobs per se, and if you listen to the Obama administration, what they're ultimately talking about is carbon emissions. That that is the, that is the backdrop for all the discussions of green energy, clean energy, et cetera. The U.S. is dramatically cutting its CO2 emissions, and it is happening without carbon taxes or carbon caps. Okay, so first to this definitional problem. In March, Senator Bingaman from New Mexico introduced the Clean Energy Standard Act of 2012. In that bill, the, the, the senator projected that the U.S., or, or uh, his legislation says, the U.S. should achieve 80% of its electricity production from clean energy sources by 2035. What did he define as clean energy? Well, of course, he included renewables, but he also included natural gas and nuclear, and rightly so. But ever since the failure of the cap-and-trade legislation in 2009, what we've seen on the green left is a pivot away from what they call green energy now to clean energy. Well, if Bingaman's definition of clean energy stands, the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, and many other groups on the left will oppose it. Why? Because they're adamantly opposed to natural gas and to nuclear. Now, if Mr. Wagner will agree with me that natural gas and nuclear are indeed green, and clean, then we clearly will have some area for agreement. My second point, green energy jobs either do not exist or they are too expensive. Well, what is a green job? Now, this matters. This definition matters a lot. Last year, uh, the Brookings Institution included transit workers, bus drivers, in its definition of green jobs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics does as well. I will put a $100 bill on the table to right here, right now, and challenge any of you to stop a bus anywhere in New York City and ask that bus driver what sector he's in. I will guarantee you, or I'll risk my 100 bucks, he will not tell you I'm a green energy worker. Other occupations that fit under the Bureau of Labor Statistics definition of green jobs include bicycle shop employees, clerks at used record stores, <laughs> garbage collectors, and energy industry lobbyists. Industries that cannot make it in the free market only talk about jobs in order to attempt to justify their subsidies. January 2011, Bob Deneen, the head of the Renewable Fuels Association, sent a letter to President Obama uh, which touted the claim that the domestic corn ethanol sector directly supports 100,000 jobs. And he called the ethanol sector, quote, an unparalleled job creator. Well, what was Deneen asking for? More subsidies, of course. 
Now, those subsidies ran out at the end of last year, but nevertheless, if you look at the Congressional Budget Office numbers and their estimates for what the actual cost of those ethanol subsidies were to the U.S. economy, each of those ethanol-related jobs cost the U.S. economy at least $160,000 per year. The wind energy sector constantly talks about these jobs. In 2010, the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts, Susan Combs, estimated that each green job associated with the wind energy business in Texas, Texas has more wind energy capacity than any other state, more than 10,000 megawatts, each of those wind-related jobs in Texas cost the state's taxpayers $1.6 million. Last August, the New York Times reported Quote, federal and state efforts to stimulate creation of green jobs have largely failed. The article looked at the Alta Wind Project in California, which will pretty soon be the world's largest wind project. When completed, the Times says it will bring only 50 permanent operations and maintenance jobs to rural Kern County. The same project got $468 million under Section 1603 of the Treasury, uh, uh, from the U.S. Treasury under the stimulus bill. $468 million for 50 jobs works out to $9.3 million per job. The promotion of green jobs has merely fat, uh, my third point, has merely fattened corporate profits at the expense of taxpayers. Under the stimulus bill, some $3.2 billion in tax-free cash grants went to just eight companies all of them either current or former members of the board of directors of the American Wind Energy Association. The biggest winners of the, of the, uh, uh, the stimulus sweepstakes, Spanish utility, Iberdrola, collected $1 billion in grants. The German utility, Eon, $542.5 million in tax-free cash grants. Princeton, New Jersey-based NRG Energy and its partners have secured $5.2 billion in federal loan guarantees to build solar energy projects. NRG has a market capitalization of $3.4 billion. Last December, David Crane, the CEO of NRG, told the New York Times, quote, I have never been seen anything that I have had to do in my 20 years in the power industry that involved less risk than these projects. Why is the government purposely and, and actively reducing risk for big business? It is not the role of government. General Electric has a market cap, uh, checked it the other day, has a market cap of $200 billion, one of the biggest industrial firms on the planet. And yet GE and its partners in the Shepherd's Flat Wind Project in Oregon are getting a $1 billion loan guarantee they are also getting a cash grant of $490 million. The Shepherd's Flat Wind Project, when completed, will have 35 permanent jobs. If we just count the cost of that $490 million cash grant, each of those green jobs will cost $16 million. Nothing against GE. They see the money out there. They are going to aggressively go after it, and they have. But remember, this is a company, a large industrial firm that Several news organizations have reported paid zero income taxes last year. Why? Why is the federal government providing huge taxpayer dollars to a company as big as GE? My fourth point, and it's a key one. The U.S. is leading the world in reducing CO2 emissions, and it is not because of renewables, carbon emission caps, carbon taxes, or subsidies. It is an incurable attack of market forces that is working in the United States' favor. May 24th, Paris-based International Energy Agency reported, I'm quoting, U.S. emissions have now fallen by 7.7 percent since 2006, the largest reduction of all countries or regions. Why? Well, there are several reasons. One is the economic downturn, of course. Another reason is lower oil use because of more efficient fleet and also that's part and, and also the fleet is being used less partly of course because of the economic downturn. But the IE says it is due largely to a substantial shift from coal to gas in the power sector. Why are utilities in the coal sector switching to gas? Because gas in many regions of the U.S. now is far cheaper than coal. The IEA also said that in, in 2011, when compared to 2010, carbon emissions in the U.S. fell by 92 million tons, or 1.7 percent, again, 
primarily due to ongoing switching from coal to natural gas in power generation. I double-checked IEA's numbers. In fact, I just did it this afternoon. I looked at BP's numbers. The BP Statistical Review just came out a few days ago. 2006 to 2011, the U.S. by itself cut its emissions by more than all of the reductions in emissions from Europe and Eurasia combined. That's more than 30 countries. It was a reduction of, of nearly 400 million tons. Over that same time period, the, the countries in Asia Pacific increased their CO2 emissions by 3.5 billion tons. We can have discussions about carbon taxes, and I think Mr. Wagner is going to has, has, has written in favor of carbon taxes. To me, it is exactly the wrong policy for the United States. Why would the U.S. impose a carbon tax on itself now when we are already achieving far better results, far better uh, reductions than what is happening in Europe, which has a emissions trading scheme and a de facto carbon tax in place? I also looked at Germany, biggest industrial uh, uh, country in Europe, one of the great industrial powers on the planet. Germany's CO2 emissions from 2006 through 2011 fell by 91 million tons. Germany has 81 million uh, citizens. The U.S. has 311 million. Even if we assume Germany is the same size as the U.S., on a, on a, on a, put it on, on the same par basis, the reductions in the U.S. would still exceed those that we've seen in Germany. Why? Market forces. The shale revolution, un unforeseen by really anyone in the energy business, including me, my, my, book, my third book, Gusher of Lies, I was predicting huge LNG imports. Published in 2008, everyone was projecting, projecting huge LNG exports from the United States. That's liquefied natural gas. Now, the smartest m minds and the smartest companies in the American energy business are looking at massive natural gas exports from the United States with liquefied natural gas. What we've seen is the power of the market exceeding by far the power of regulators to anticipate and provide any kind of carbon reductions that might be dreamed of under carbon caps or carbon taxes. Final point. Again, we talk about, oh, well, and there, we've heard this from politicians in the United States, the U.S. should be following the European model. Well, we, I've already mentioned the European model with regard to the emissions trading scheme has already shown that it is not working. And now Germany is building more coal plants than the United States on a grid parity basis or just on a nominal basis. The Germans now have 8,400 megawatts of new coal-fired generation capacity under construction, and they're planning another 5,500 megawatts. The United States should not be subsidizing or mandating green jobs. They should be a, an active participant in, a, in promoting cheap, abundant, reliable energy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very tempted to dive right in, but let me first give my opening remarks, and I understand then we can respond directly to each other. Um, so <laughs> let me just step back for a second here. Um, you're essentially here for two reasons. So basically, there are, sort of, there are two big problems that we are looking at. One is that global warming poses one of the most intractable challenges of the, um, to the planet, certainly of my generation, possibly ever. And two is the fact that we already have and still are spending hundreds of billions of dollars on energy subsidies. So yes, we have a problem, right? We have, we have several problems. Um, the big one, I would argue, is global warming. Um, the fact that the average American emits around 20 tons of CO2, the average European, despite the amazing decreases over the last five years um, in the U.S., emits about half as much, 10 tons. Right, so I'm a dual citizen. I get 30. Um, but still, those are huge numbers. Right? Added up over 300 million Americans, or 7 billion of us, really, that's a huge, huge problem. Um, we are running out of atmosphere long before we are running out of coal, oil, gas, or any of the other sources of pollution. Um, now, I appreciate the fact that this debate is not about the science. Right? We can all agree that uh, if once 97% of climate scientists say it is a problem, it is a problem. 
right? Four out of five dentists recommend sugar-free gum. Let's not go into the sugared gum territory here, please. Um, at least not in the debate here, uh, <laughs> officially. We can take it outside after. Um, okay, so what we can and must do, though, look at the economics. Still a science, I would argue, but still a, a social science. Yes. Every one of these tons, every one of the 20 tons that the average American emits, every one of the 10 tons the average European emits, causes on average at least about $20 worth of damage to health, ecosystems, the economy. Right? Now, of course, we all are already paying for that damage. Right? When we board a flight, everyone, all seven billion of us, are paying fractions of a penny for the damage that that flight causes. We are paying for the damage, it's just not the person causing it who pays for the damage. No one says don't fly, right? No one says don't drive or don't use any energy. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure some people would, but that's clearly not the way to go here, right? All I'm saying is pay the full cost. Pay for the dumb damage you cause. You break it, you pay for it. Every ton of coal, every barrel of oil causes more in external damages, damages we now shove off onto society, socialize, if you will, than those tons of coal and barrels of oil add value to GDP. Let me say this again. The socialized cost, right, the, the cost we push off onto society, the pollution associated with burning coal and oil dwarfs the monetary value added to the economy. That, by the way, comes from a study of a team of um, economists around Bill Nordhaus um, at Yale. Um, and Nordhaus is typically one of the more conservative voices in the debate coming up with lower estimates. Even that leads to that conclusion. So even a fairly conservative calculus would get us to a place where the now socialist costs of these forms of energy are higher than the benefits. Now, I'm clearly not saying we shouldn't use coal, we shouldn't use gas, we shouldn't use oil, much like we shouldn't be banning flights or plastic bags or 24-ounce drinks for that matter, right? Go drive, fly, air condition your home, just pay for the full price, right? Economics 101. And pretty much every economist worth his or her professional crest would agree. And you can go to Art Laffer and Greg Mankey on the one hand and Krugman and Stiglitz on the other. Everyone says polluters ought to pay for the damage they cause. Uh, we don't have many theorems or laws in economics. This is very, very close to one of them. Okay, so that's economics 101. Um, how about let's move to economics 102. Economics 102 pretty much with equal force to economics 101 says that there isn't just the negative pollution spillover, there's also a large positive spillover that we should be worried about here. When you sit in your garage and uh, tinker around um, on the next great invention, you consider the benefits to you personally. You don't consider the benefits of that innovation to society. But you'll consider the money you will make, not what it will produce for others. So you do not tend to consider the shoulders you're creating for others to stand on, or for that matter, the shoulders for others to avoid, because you've gone down a wrong path. That's the positive technological learning, learning by doing spillover. Now, there are social benefits to research, development, and deployment of new technologies, and right now, many of these benefits, much like the pollution, costs are being socialized. You work, others gain. Right? Socialism. Okay, so what do you do in this case? Well, it's the exact opposite of taxing, capping pollution. You subsidize innovation. You subsidize research, development, and deployment. So to make sure the engineers and entrepreneurs and everyone else is compensated for their work, that's, that is the only answer. It's the economics 102 answer. Actually need to read to the 
um, several chapters back in the textbook, but still, it is a very, very standard economic answer that says we ought to subsidize basic R&D, and in this case, R&D and D, research, development, and deployment. Um, it's maybe not quite as intuitive as the Pluto Pace principle, but still. And yes, we need government to build interstate highways, for example. Um, the Intercontinental Railroad, right? We have example after example where it is government that provides the initial funding. And yes, of course it is the private sector with much deeper pockets that comes in sooner rather than later, hopefully sooner. But the initial impetus still, in many, most of these instances, comes from government. Um, now, the important part here for this Econ 102 argument, of course, is that no one is asking for permanent subsidies, right? It says start strong and scale down pretty much immediately. Um, and of course, much like politics interferes with Econ 101, and we don't have an appropriate price on CO2, we don't have a, ca a cap on CO2, politics, of course, also interferes with Economics 102. We don't necessarily always get the subsidies that economists would argue we ought to be getting here. Um, now, there is at least one very, very positive example of this. We can get to that in, in a bit more detail um, later, but it actually happens to be California, the California Solar Initiative, CSI. Um, it was a team of Stanford economists actually, that looked at these subsidies and pretty much concluded that, yep, government sometimes can get it right. Um, the issue here is not the solar panel itself, but it was the cost of installing the panel. In fact, deployment, not R&D, it was the deployment portion. So you have electricians and roofers who need to climb the learning curve pretty quickly to get up to speed on how to actually install those panels. Well, the first panel takes a while. The millionth panel, you kind of get the hang of it. So essentially what you do, Econ 102 in this case, you have a fairly sizable initial subsidy. And yes, do scale that back immediately. 10% per year. If you go um, out 10 years, the subsidy is gone. That was what this team of Stanford economists estimated ought to be done. That is, in fact, what Sacramento very, very closely did in this case. And you have a solution that both adheres to Econ 101, we ought to price pollution, tax or cap it, and Econ 102, subsidize R, D, and D, research, development, and deployment to an extent that allows us to internalize this now socialized subsidy that research and development, uh, socialized um, externality that research and development provide. Um, okay, so two problems, two solutions. Right? Pollution is bad, price it. Research and development is good, subsidize it. This is about the simplest possible point going back to standard economics. This is not the environmentalist speaking, this is not EDF speaking, this is the economist in me speaking. Econ 101, you tax the bad stuff, you subsidize the good stuff. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna all sit at this table and kind of uh, mix it up right here, not get up at the podium anymore. Uh, but uh, we'll have some uh, relatively brief, sure. let's say, two, three minute rebuttals no problem. from each. And we'll start with uh, Robert. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Wagner, I'll, I'll agree with you on that R&D is good and it should be subsidized. Wholeheartedly ready to agree on that point. Um, and, and that puts me firmly in the camp of Breakthrough Institute, Brookings, uh, and others who have talked about this. In fact, uh, there was a Brookings report that uh, re released earlier this month that said federal resources should be directed toward investments that support innovation which minimize the cost of environmental protection. Absolutely. 
and and uh, the the, uh, the Brookings Breakthrough uh, World Resource Institute report that came out earlier uh, this year, I think it was in April, said exactly the same thing. But they faulted the issue of deployment, as I did just a moment ago, because what we've seen with the deployment problem is that what we've done is direct m not just millions, but even billions of dollars to large corporations. That uh, <coughs> is the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. Carbon taxation. Okay, a few years ago I thought, well, and, and, and if I were an economist, this is clearly the cleanest solution, and if it were viable, I'd be for it. It's not viable, and therein lies the problem. What is the issue? Well, as I said before, we're decarbonizing more quickly than the Europeans, even though they have a de facto carbon tax. But the issue now is, when it comes to CO2, is not the U.S. and it's not the EU, it's the rest of the world. It's countries like Vietnam, like South Korea, like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Trinidad, all of whom are coming into the modern world. What is the issue? Well, we need to make clean energy or green energy cheap. And that was the fundamental point of the Breakthrough Institute Bre Brookings report. Fundamentally agree. But therein lies the issue is that right now coal consumption is skyrocketing. Over the last decade, coal consumption has increased by more than the increase in nuclear, natural gas, and oil combined. Why? Because the demand for electricity globally is so incredibly high. Over the last 20 years, we've seen an addition of about uh, a, a new demand in the electricity market, <clears throat> excuse me, of 450 terawatt hours per year. That's a Brazil per year over the last 20 years. And the latest data from the IEA projects another Brazil every year through 2035. And nearly all of that is going to be coming from coal. So fast forward to today at the Rio Plus 20 conference, what's the issue? Well, the developing countries are saying, we want subsidies from the rich countries. And the rich countries are saying, well, you know what? We're broke. And they are. And meanwhile, the developing countries have said consistently, from the first Rio, through Kyoto, through Copenhagen, Cancun, Bonn, Durban, you name it, we will never, 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 never agree to put a carbon tax or a carbon cap on our own emissions. So in a perfect world, I will agree with you, carbon tax is the right way to go. But we live in an imperfect world. We do. Um, and what you just said was absolutely right about three to five years ago. I can tell you the waxman markey climate bill, cap and trade law in this country, started with first page. It mentioned India and China, and not in a positive way. Right? Anything that we do must not, cannot make us uncompetitive vis-a-vis -vis others. Well, let let me update you on what, is, what has happened since. China, as part of its 12th five-year plan, is developing seven regional cap and trade systems. India has a coal tax, raising $500 million per year, and yes, investing, reinvesting that in its solar initiative in this case. South Korea just passed a cap and trade law, in effect, starting 2015. Australia has a carbon price, turning into a cap on its carbon emissions by 2015. Country after country is moving. And actually, look at the US. Right? We have a cap on CO2 emissions in California. We have one in the Northeast as well. Um, but California, of course, is the one that actually does or will matter once it gets into effect starting next year with a fairly substantial 2020 target of bringing emissions down to 1990 levels. So yes, it is, it ought to be, it must be market forces that drive us in the right direction. And it is the task of government to level the playing field in the sense of making sure that everyone does in fact pay for his or her own pollution that's what a tax and cap is. It is the most hands-off way you can imagine in how to approach this topic. Cap emissions, tax emissions, and get out of the way. And that's the Econ 101 answer. And I, I'm glad we all agree on that. Now, I don't know how much time I have quickly to go, perhaps in the reverse order since I addressed the last one, Fairly. of the other four points. Um, so yes, on the cutting emissions part, but if we all, since we all believe in using market forces for this, then let's use them. 
it is fantastic that the U.S. has decreased emissions because of the switch from coal to natural gas. Now, just because coal is bad doesn't mean that natural gas gets to be good. What we can and should and must do is look at the emissions, the relative emissions, and not pick winners. Right? You challenged me to pick nuclear and natural gas as a winner. No, I'm not in the business of picking winners. I'm, picking, I'm in the business of identifying losers, and that's CO2. Make sure everyone pays the appropriate price for the damage that pollution costs, and then get out of, the, out of the way. And once again, this is me speaking, not EDF or anyone else, but if nuclear is the winner in the end, well, it wasn't any one of us deciding, it was market forces that decided this. Now, of course, it turns out when you do look at government and at subsidies, subsidies that are currently being spent on renewables make the front page of newspapers, what doesn't necessarily make the front page of newspapers right now is all the subsidies we spend on all the other stuff because it's such old news. We've been spending this for decades, both directly and indirectly. Right now, I, um, EIA, the International Energy Ag Agency, is estimating about $500 billion in fossil fuel subsidies globally. It's tens of billions of dollars in the U.S. alone, both in this case, it's actually mainly direct subsidies, but then you also add things like indirect subsidies. You were talking about um, giving money to big corporations. Well, offshore oil drilling as a famous example. Right? Damages from offshore oil drilling by law are capped at $75 million a pop. Right? Congress in its finite w wisdom in the early 90s capped it at $75 million and failed to, for example, just tag it to inflation to say that actually $75 million by, m by now is, is worth nothing for such a company, right? We are subsidizing BP, offshore drilling from BP, simply because we cap damages at an incredibly low number. Now, of course, the same applies to the nuclear industry. We are doing the same thing there. And let me end it, end, end it here and um, I guess say again that this is not EDF speaking, but I'm pretty sure that um, EDF as an organization would in fact be very willing to enter a bargain with you or a grand bargain that says, okay, let's remove all subsidies from renewables as long if and only if we make the nuclear industry pay back all subsidies that it has received over the last decades. Same for the oil industry, same for every other coal industry for that matter, or every other fossil fuel based um, sector or CO2 intensive sector. All and right, in that case, you what actually about have. It, Robert? Let's, let's start to mix it up here. What okay. about it? Well, he's laid down the challenge. Would you? All right, well, look, were I king, I'd say Fairfield, no favor. Let's let all the energy sources compete. Fairfield, no favor. So, but I, I have to take issue. You said that there are issues, the fossil fuel industry gets tens of billions of dollars in subsidies in the U.S. alone. According to the Energy Information Administration, it's $2.8 billion per year. Billion this with a B, correct? Billion with a B. Okay. If you just look at the cost savings to the U.S. consumer, I, I'm for cheap energy, and I make no apologies for that. I'm, I, I view carbon taxation, I understand it's the perfect solution in the economist world, but when I look at people that I know who are making minimum wage and in some cases less than that, where's the value for them? We can talk all ab about greenhouse gases, et cetera, but where's the value for them? I don't see value for them in increasing the cost of energy ever. And that's why I think that the issue now at Rio plus 20 mm -hmm. is failing again because the developing countries are saying, no way, no how. We're not going to agree to a tax. And if you want to give us money, we're happy to get it. Well, I let me reframe Robert's point here, if I might. Right. If a, do you see a carbon tax as being laid on top of our current income tax and sales tax, all the other taxes? Is that an additional tax on the economy, or is it a replacement tax? Well, it, it could or should certainly be um, a replacement in the sense that what you're trying to do is tax bads, not goods. Sure. Right? We like employment. Let's decrease the payroll tax. Let's increase um, tax on pollution, which is in fact 
probably the best way to ensure that these taxes are not regressive. Well, but enough. actually, I mean, I, I'm very glad that you are concerned about the distributive impact of pollution taxes, which is which is good, right? And sure. this, frankly, is Th that's kind of speak for who pays. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> But, right? but, but, Doctor, but Doctor, how do we deal, though, with the rest of the world? I mean, that seems to me the fundamental point, is that we're, we're reducing our coal mm -hmm. use. So are the Europeans. Yeah. So what do, you, what do we say to Vietnam, I just China, gave you the, India, I can give you the list again, or I can actually point you to the New York Times website tomorrow morning. The reason why I was late to this, I apologize, was because a, an op-ed will be up um, tomorrow, basically making some of these points. Um, but tomorrow night. Um, but but uh, essentially... When you say that um, you would fault developing countries, emerging economies, for increasing your emissions, increasing their emissions, this is energy poverty right there, right? If anyone ought to be allowed to increase their emissions at all, it is countries that have 300 million people without access to electricity at all. Agreed. Right? And even though, despite all of that, those countries, right? India has, in fact, a coal tax. The U.S. does not. Now, it's a buck, right? It doesn't do enough. <laughs> but still, China actually does have a cap and trade, has seven regional cap and trade system trials, essentially, where they are testing out which approach works best. And you can bet that if sure. or since <laughs> this will emerge as one of the policy solutions, well, in its 13th five year plan, starting four years from now, we will, in fact, have cap, tax, some well, kind of... Fair enough. But if you also just look at DOE mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. the Chinese now have about 300,000 megawatts of new coal-fired power plants in the queue. Mm -hmm. So it, if Because they, it's if the they cheapest they source of energy, and it shouldn't be. Because what is not included is the fact that to you, as the one building the plant, it is cheap. To everybody else, right? you're socializing the costs left and right. L let me jump in here and try to get back to our, our core, and should innovation, so-called, renewables be subsidized? <coughs> and Gernot said, Robert, there would be a scaling back immediately, phasing out after 10 years of the deployment. Which, of course, right. did not happen, never happened well, wait, 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 for wait, 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 fossil energy, right? Robert, does that placate <coughs> your concerns about corporate welfare and all the other the, stuff. The phasing out of the renewables, subsidies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we're already well, seeing... Well, first we need to have them, but... Well, we're already seeing that. I, I made a list. December, the U.K. cut its green feed-in tariffs for renewables by more than half. Just yesterday, the Telegraph reported that the Cameron government is going to eliminate wind-related subsidies by 2020. Uh, Italy's frozen subsidies for large-scale solar. They're going to cut feed-in tariffs over the next six months. In, in January, Spain, uh, which spent more than any other European country, more than any uh, country in the world, $70 billion on wind and solar since uh, But that's not because they've been so it's, successful it's, it's, that they're phasing them out, right? Well, no, and and, well. But, and if you look at the European, uh, Spain is in an economic crisis. So, I, you know... So I, you, are you blaming the economic crisis on the solar subsidies? I didn't say that. Okay. But, you know, go on in, in Spain. Now, so here's an example. In last month, two solar companies announced plans for a 400-megawatt PV project in the Extremadura uh, region in Extremadura region in Spain. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost 450 million euros. It's being built without subsidies. So in that case, I'm and all why for is it. Th and why is that happening now? Well, uh, uh, I don't... <laughs> because the cost of solar, and the cost of solar panels decreased and that's by great. a factor of three within three years. That's fantastic. And, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm why did that happen? I, I'm adamantly pro-solar. I think solar has a huge future mm -hmm. because they're driving down the cost and they're increasing their power densities. That's great. I have solar panels on the roof of my house. Yeah. I'm adamantly in favor of solar. But the idea that we have to subsidize these companies to deploy it, they have to compete fundamentally, not just here, mm -hmm. around the world with coal. And, and, and lesser until they can beat coal on price Without subsidies, without mandates, countries like Vietnam, like China, like India are going to burn as much coal as they can. Okay, and, and therein the, lies the issue. And the, well, well, let me turn the question on you of the phase out, and that gets to, to Robert's okay. point too, right? The ethanol industry mm -hmm. is a controversial industry. It's concerned that it's uh, it's That's using primary food stuff, Iowa, sure. right? And yet today, the EPA has increased the the blending requirement for ethanol from ten to fifteen mm -hmm. percent. 
So we're seeing the opposite of phase out, and to use an economist term, we're, one might argue that there's the danger of rent seeking, that once you get addicted to these subsidies, that there's a political nexus that keeps them in place. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about that? Uh, yes, I am, of course. But why are we subsidizing ethanol? Because the first presidential primary is in Iowa. Right? It's the only reason, frankly. Uh, and why will we continue to subsidize ethanol? Because the first presidential primary will continue to be in Iowa. <laughs> and that's the only reason why we will continue to do so. So yes, right? Am I concerned about that? Absolutely. Turns out corn-based ethanol is actually worse for greenhouse um, gas emission in terms of its impact than pretty much anything else you could do. Um, so yes, sure, but does that lead to a conclusion that says, and therefore, right, let's either not worry or be agnostic about global warming, for example, no. Of course not. Well, what Government about that? subsidies what are a what problem. What about that, Robert? I mean, that's the predicate of Gernot's remarks, is that global warming is a transcendent crisis, <coughs> and that your transitory fears about the cost to low-income consumers must be subordinate to saving the planet. Are you underestimating the importance of global warming? <coughs> well, <laughs> gee, I don't, <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know whether I'm underestimating it, overestimating it. The issue for me then though is again, what what is the issue, what's the value of electricity to, I, I heard your point about the, the, the economist who said the socialized cost of coal and oil dwarfs the value added to the economy. Have they been to Hanoi? Have they been to? I've been, yeah, uh, three mean, times so far, yeah. F fair enough. Mm -hmm. Have you been to? Have they been to countries in Guatemala, elsewhere, where mm -hmm. there is scant availability of electricity? Mm -hmm. If the people that are using that electricity and getting lights for the first time, mm -hmm. I don't think they're overly worried about the externalities of the cost of the electricity that they're getting because it is so incredibly transformative to their lives. Mm -hmm. So it is. The, 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 the problem though, I guess the other issue that I'd just like to bring up quickly is that, so I understand your point about the econ e Can economics. Can I just quickly respond no, to sure, this one? So, so it turns out the places where solar especially is most cost competitive right now already sure. are exactly those places. Right, rural, the, the rural very rural places, places where Absolutely. distributed solar generation is sure. in fact the way to go. Absolutely, and it makes right. a lot of sense because they don't have to build the transmission lines. Exactly. But, but to go to your point about deployment, and, and if the government is going to subsidize green jobs, where are the successes? We've seen, uh, and uh, we've seen wreckage, evergreen solar, laid off 800 workers, got $858 million in taxpayer subsidies. In August, Solyndra closed down, laid off 1,100 workers, cost to taxpayers $535 million. Beacon Power, energy storage firm, got $35, $39 million government back okay, loan. Okay, so here's the success. $29 million from Pennsylvania, cha filed Chapter 11. Range Fuels, Enter One, Babcock and, and Brown. And I'm sure you could go keep yeah. going, I, yes. Yeah. There's a lot. So now please, I don't have the list with me, now name every fossil fuel-based energy company that has ever name, laid off anyone. <laughs> well, that's a good well, comeback. And they're all getting, of course, right. billions of dollars in subsidies. Well, but they're, uh, that's, th okay, I'll take issue with that. If, you, if we have $2.8 billion in overall subsidies for fossil fuels overall in the United direct States. subsidies. Does that include the $75 million cap on damages from offshore drilling? No, no it doesn't. Okay. And, and what was the cost to BP of the spill from the Macondo well? $20 billion at a minimum, mm -hmm. and they're paying it. Yeah, of course. And they're yeah. still running ads encouraging Because it turns out oil is Louisiana. a pretty profitable business, and they would rather keep and, and the opportunity to keep drilling in the U.S. Sure. Than but not, but, but right? the idea that these companies individually are collecting billions of dollars in subsidies is simply not true. There's 14,000 oil and gas companies in the United States. Mm -hmm. Even if you there are $2.8 billion in subsidies, there's no way those companies can be collecting that kind of uh, money. None of them, th you, n if, what would happen if Exxon Mobil or so Chevron so was getting a billion global, dollars? Do you dispute the global figure of $500 billion well, in fossil Well, that's a global US figure, and I don't doubt that. But that uh, now you're talking about gasoline subsidies in Caracas and mm -hmm. gasoline subsidies in Riyadh yep. that well, don't have anything to- And our topic is U.S. federal government. Right, and the, and the topic and here is the have, U.S. And we have about 60 to $80 billion of those here in the U.S. Right? Well, it is not according to the EIA. Indirect subsidies. Exactly. Well, okay. Because well, direct so is what are dwarfed the, what are by risk reduction and everything else that we are doing to subsidize. Well, fossil fair enough. I'm not familiar with those numbers, but numbers that you're citing. But and amazingly, I'm looking of at course, EIA numbers. 
Sure, but amazingly, of course, right, right now we are not even just not even talking about internalizing any of the damage, the socialized damage. Right now we are purely talking about you're still subsidizing an industry. Sure. That for no economic reason needs subsidies. It's not infant industry protection. It is uh, nothing along these lines. And of course, we are taking steps backward on taxing the bad. Okay, well, fair enough. Let, let's open it up. We've got uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes left, and I would like to get the, uh, uh, the audience in, in here. And I see uh, Robert James in the, in the back row, and I want to get Bob in here. Uh, th uh, there's one thing that both of you agree on, uh, and that is you're in favor of, uh, of research. And uh, I'd like to ask if you really looked at this very carefully, have you ever actually had to put money, your money or a company's money or, or a medical company's money to, to pick out research? Everybody's in favor of research, but it's tough. What are you looking for? What, how do you do it efficiently? Uh, who chooses it? And uh, I, I'd be, it is not an easy thing to do. Uh, yeah, I, I, I take your point. Yeah. And I, think I think that's, that's, a, that's a challenge for both speakers. Yeah, oh, yeah. So I'd be careful. Now, who's better at it, government or private? I don't know. If you want one good example, I suppose the government should have been working hard on... Uh, on um, fracking and, uh, and horizontal dr drilling because that saved us more uh, of pollution than anything has happened. And this was done not by a big oil company or somebody, but some guy you haven't even heard of who started on this. And uh, it let, saved let, let's, uh, let's hear from them. Go ahead. Well, it was in fact basic government research that led to the technology that we now use to, uh, to frack natural gas. So yes, once again, right? Uh, well, about 30 years ago, but yeah. Well, and so then, Gernot, would, would, would you then say that, that that should have been deployment money too, that once the fracking technique, then the government should have inv invested in the, the National Fracking Corporation? Uh, well, not quite, because as we all know, natural gas still causes CO2 emissions. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I'll just make a quick point. I, I, th I think that, that clearly government has a role here, and um, basic R&D, as I said before, Brookings has come out with a report in favor of this, as, you know, and, and several others. It makes sense. This is something that government can do. Are, will they pick sectors that make the most sense? Well, you know, that's a risk. But what, what is the area that, that's the holy grail? It's energy mm -hmm. storage. It's always been energy storage. And government has invested a lot of money. Have they come up with some technology that is a game changer? Not to my knowledge. Well, glad you mentioned energy uh, storage. Real quick. Very quickly. Um, again, not in the business of picking winners here, but just one example. Light sail energy. 15 cents per kilowatt hour at this point. It use com uses compressed air, essentially, and... Um, Light sail energy. It's the, it's the name of the company. The, it's compressed air, essentially, energy storage. Right now, they're able to deliver 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So when it's released, it releases energy. The, the yeah, exa air. exactly, right? So it's an energy storage container. It's actually a shipping container that stores compressed air that, that stores energy at 15 cents per kilowatt hour, right? That's already cost competitive in some areas in this country, even. Okay, other questions, other questions. Uh, the gentleman in the... In the Front row here. Wait for the microphone, if you would. Uh, now, I'm a little troubled by the moral high ground, uh, Dr. Wagner, as far as what you're taking as far as economics, environmental, or even the effectiveness of uh, uh, emission controls. I was a member of the Chicago Climate Exchange for seven years. I got to know an ex an, a very extensive part of people who run the uh, cap and trade in Europe. And one of the things that keeps coming back, one of the morals is that the CDM, which is one of the major mechanisms to do it, that the effectiveness in the long-term guaranteed delivery of emission reduction is overstated greatly. And as I watch that marketplace work right now, 
in Europe, all it does, it looks like a heart attack machine attached to their economy, and the benefits go to the other parts of the world because you don't qualify unless you do it in another part of the world. So that how, is do, the we, how do we of balance CDM, out? Yes, Who they, decides what carbon is worth? Maybe so somebody define question. CDM for me, the acronym. CDM oh, is a clean, clean development mechanism. Right. This is a way, in fact, to decrease. This is a way to decrease emissions in developing countries, and make the reduction count in a cap and trade system like the one in Europe. That is not the primary way to decrease emissions in Europe, which is in fact to decrease emissions in Europe. It does affect, but essentially what it does is it shifts emissions from um, developing countries to Europe in this case. Right? It is an offset. It is, uh, you mentioned the Chicago Climate Exchange, which was sort of a voluntary system along these lines, which I, I have to say fortunately um, didn't go anywhere because it is a voluntary system in this case. It's an offset. What we need is a firm cap on emissions, an absolute cap on emissions. But and yes, that even despite the recession, despite everything else, <laughs> works very well in Europe. The prices are right now about ten dollars, ten euros um, per ton of CO2, which is you can argue much, much too low. But still, it is ten dollars. It's more than ten dollars, more than we have here in the U.S. But, but Dr. Okay. Wagner, we're al we're already seeing the failure of the ETS. I, I, do, I have a Reuters story just the other day. And remind um, the audience what the ETS is. Uh, the, uh, it's the EU's emissions trading scheme. So they have a cap and trade system in place in Europe. Reuters says that German utilities this year are likely to produce 12 percent more electricity from coal this year than they did last. Why? Because the ETS was, you know, the idea, the regulators thought they could get the market right, and they didn't. And the price of the, the, the carbon credits under the ETS has fallen so low mm -hmm. that utilities in Europe are now burning more coal because they can buy the credits and, and, and simply fire up the coal-fired generators. So I, I understand your, the, from a pure economist point of view how it's supposed to work, mm -hmm. but we're already seeing over and over that it is not, in fact. Well, here's the, the how it RGGI, does work in Europe. You mentioned the RGGI mm -hmm. here in the U.S. It's failed. New Jersey's already fa uh, uh, already. RGGI, I'm, I'm going to do this. Regional green, greenhouse gas. The Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. The, the <coughs> New Jersey has already pulled out. Again, mm -hmm. the interest in the, in the market is so low. Again, the credits have fallen all so right, low right, that so it's, it's so effectively. The, gen the general challenge here is that, that the taxation methodology, which is fundamental to what you're doing, might not work well in practice. And does that concern you? Um, if it didn't work well, it would, yes. But where is First it, okay, of all, so where is this it working is not, well? Well, Europe is actually one example where emissions year after year because of the emissions trading system are in fact coming down. And of course, the real reason why this ETS, why this emissions trading system um, is looked um, at as one of the prime examples of how it should be done is not because of what's happening now. It is the long-term target of reducing these emissions. That's the whole point. Right? Did emissions in the U.S. go down last year because we switched from coal to natural gas? Yes. Is switching from coal to natural gas the answer to solving global warming? No, of course not. Well, so then how do you deal, though, with the I – mean, let's cut to the chase then in Europe. Then how do you <laughs> deal with the regressive taxation issue? Because in Germany alone, we're talking about a, a, a bill per a family of four of about $200 per month more. I'm sorry, $200, $200, per, per, 200, 200 per year more per family because of these renewable energy mandates. So is that okay? I mean, to have a regressive tax for the poor? How do you deal with that? Um, I'm worried about global warming here. So first of all, let me solve one problem at a time. <laughs> um, okay. And yes, you can, blame, you can accuse me of, again, going back to sort of the fundamental economics answer. But yes, one policy problem, one policy solution. All right, the problem here we're talking about is global warming. Let's tax or cap global warming pollution. Right. If you, since we all should be worried about other issues as well, well, yes, one way is in fact to decrease the payroll tax. But you raise money through a um, carbon or gas tax, you decrease the payroll tax. You can more than overcompensate for any of the damage or okay. any of the regressiveness of a carbon tax. Okay, let me get uh, Russ Kernoyer over here. Um, time for one quick yeah. and then another quick, and then we're going to go to closing statements. 
Couldn't you just combine cheap energy with air conditioning the way we've done in the warm parts of this country? I mean, it seems to me that we're a long ways away from having to worry about these very modest increases in temperature. I mean, wouldn't we be better off letting the market allow people to afford to buy the air conditioners they need if it's getting warmer well, that, than that, it is That's now? a somewhat facetious question about could we adapt to global warming? Solve global and, warming by buying a second air conditioner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I'll, I'll put a, I'll put a good face on it, and he, he's being facetious, but but he's saying you could adapt, uh -huh. and, and that, that's a school of thought. Well, is that that we well that's an answer here for the rich guys in this room, right? So every rich person Whoa. buys a second air conditioner. No, 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 everyone no, 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 poor just suffers, right? Well, but okay, but I, uh, this is an important question. I think in the fu it's fundamentally that we don't. I don't know what the future holds. Okay, it, the planet may be getting hotter. It may be getting colder. It may be getting colder. It On which planet? Okay, can I, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, if you'll let me finish. Sure. Maybe getting hotter. Maybe getting colder. We uh. may, be, and, it, and it appears we're having more extreme weather. Okay, I don't know. There was okay. a, a, in both. <coughs> remember, just a few yeah. years. It was. I think it was winter before last. Europe had a exceptionally cold winter. Exactly. Right? China had an extreme weather ev event okay, fine. of my, one uh, consequence uh, of global warming. To my point, if I mm -hmm. may. If it's getting hotter, if it's mm -hmm. getting colder, if it's getting more extreme in either direction, we're going to have to produce a whole lot more energy. And the fundamental problem that I have with mm -hmm. the renewable sector, mm -hmm. I, I'm adamantly pro-nuclear, fundamental problem with the renewable sector, whether you're talking wind or solar, and fine, adamantly pro-solar, I'm not crazy about the wind guys, they don't like me, that's okay. They can't scale in the kind of time frame that was necessary if we're going to have to adapt to a hotter climate, colder climate, or a more extreme climate. And so I, I take your points about Solar has been growing at the rate of 50% per year over the last five years. That's fine. And today, solar wind provides 60th of wind. And wind and solar combined combine to provide about 1 200th of America's total energy needs. So we can double it, we can triple it, we can quadruple it. Mm -hmm. Wind but and we're solar a combined. Long way. Mm -hmm. They're so small. BP's statistical review doesn't even put a number on global wind and solar production. Well, it turns out it does because an hour before I came here, I had to fact check the numbers in my New York Times op-ed tomorrow. In capacity, and it is three hundred. It is three hundred gigawatts, three hundred billion watts combined of, capacity of capacity, which not produces gigawatt which hours. produces as much electricity as fifty nuclear power plants, half the U.S. nuclear fleet. That's okay. not nothing. Uh, I'm going to take one more question from Chris Peterson here, and uh, then we're going to go to closing statements. Chris, cr Chris, let's get the, uh, Chris is with the Canadian consulate here. Dr. Wagner, thank you for your comments tonight. I appreciate it. Um, can you just give a remarks on three quick topics? Um, the, uh, the outsourcing of carbon intensity to industries that don't carbon tax, because if we are talking, we are taking the moral high ground if you do go to an area that doesn't uh -huh. have a carbon tax, as we've seen happen so often. Uh -huh. um, the efficiency of the coal growth in China, despite the seven carbon uh, regional carbon tax centers. So if you're talking about how efficient they could be, but if you're looking at the new grid that's coming on in China that's going to be built for China, how well that's doing. And then um, <clears throat> the urban density. So if we're turning into an urban population, the power density with, uh, with, with the urban centers and what they'll need and how much space they'll have on the yeah. renewable side. How would much the space there would be, be enough for to power renewables? the cities? Yes. If we're, re if we're going towards, you know, majority urban uh, since happened since 2009, on a global okay. scale, how that will um, be faced. Sure. Well, I mean, let's start with the outsourcing of carbon intensity, right? What matters in the end is how much carbon each of us consumes, not what each of us produces. So, well, not to get too much into the details here, but for example, if you have a cap and trade system, you cap your emissions, what you ought to do is in fact have uh, the several technical terms for it, a border carbon adjustment of sorts. Right? You, you are not able to move your industry across the border and then export the same stuff back into the same country. Right? Everyone ought to be treated the same. Right? That's a very simple policy fix that does exactly, that, that solves that problem, essentially. Right? It's a policy that has to be put in place, but it's not rocket science. There's a solution to that. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm going to insist that we keep going here. Okay, so the efficiency of coal. So I guess I believe what you're referring to is that um, there are efficiency gains to be had by building more efficient coal plants. So you could conceivably decrease CO2 emissions, for example, by building more efficient coal plants. Right? Is, that, is that what you're referring to? Uh, 
sure, right? It'll get us 5 10% more efficient. It doesn't get us to where we need to be, right? So yes, right, should we, build, should we make sure that every coal plant we do have is as efficient as possible? Absolutely. Is efficient coal the answer to global warming? No. And your final question about urban density. density. Whether, whether renewables can power our cities. Um, well, I, mean, I guess there are several points here, right? But one key point is that, of course, the average resident in a city consumes much less energy for right, apartments, driving, or the lack of driving and whatever, whatnot, um, than, than non-city dwellers, all right? So there is that going on. Um, and well, could we power that and electricity demand through renewables? I don't see every. I don't see a difference why we shouldn't be able to uh, to use renewables to power the lesser electricity demands in a city vis vis-a-vis the electricity that is needed anywhere else. Of course. Okay. Time now for our concluding remarks, and uh, uh, in the reverse order that we began with, Robert will begin, followed by Gernot von. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Um, well, I just have to react to that one point, that last point. If we were just to replace Indian Point here in, the, in, in New York with wind energy, for instance. We would need a land area at least half the size of the state of Rhode Island, on the order of 500 square miles, if we use two watts per square meter as the average power density for wind energy, and that is a uh, very reliable number, and I have numerous citations for that. So the, the energy sprawl issue is a key one for renewables, and particularly for the wind energy business, which is why I think solar, particularly solar shingles, solar rooftop solar, has a much uh, brighter future than wind does. And so I'm adamantly pro-solar. I'm for cheap energy. I'm for cheap, abundant, reliable energy. I'm, my fundamental uh, energy policy is I'm for air conditioning and cold beer for everybody. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and therein is the issue. Mm -hmm. Which, and, and it's the one that I, I wish we could have gotten m m more agreement on, which is that we haven't addressed Brazil. We still haven't addressed what we're going to say to South Korea, to the Chinese, to South the South Korea Indians. has a cap. Hang on, hang on. We haven't <laughs> solved then what we say in to Vietnam or all of these other countries in which coal consumption is skyrocketing because the value of electricity is so high. Electricity is the currency of modernity. And the countries that have it are moderate, and the countries that don't are not. Fundamentally, full stop. A, a couple final points. Carbon tax, I agree, is the is in perfect solution in theory. But politically, it is on a global basis, which is the issue. On a global basis, it is politically impossible to harmonize the carbon tax on a global basis and, and use the, what did you call it, border adjustment something. I don't know. It's an, I don't. Border carbon adjustment. Board, border carbon adjustment. So I'm for cheap, abundant, reliable, and for as many people as can get it. But the carbon tax is, in theory, is perfect. But in practicality, I just find it to be impossible. And I'm not saying that as a, a, a that's just looking at what we've seen mm -hmm. for 20 years now since the first Rio, uh, 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 the first Rio conference. So I, I, I understand your position, but I, I just don't see how you can fundamentally make it work. And, and if you just look at Australia, and you mentioned the carbon tax there, Roger Pilkey did a, Roger Pilkey Jr. did a calculation looking at the carbon tax in Australia and said, okay, well, they're going to impose a tax, but they haven't gone the further step, which is to say, if they're going to achieve their emissions targets, they're going to have to either build, what do you say, dozens of nuclear plants or thousands of solar facilities to replace the coal that they're burning now. So, um, again, in theory, you're right, but I, I'm, 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 I pride myself on being practical and looking at the numbers and at the politics, and I just can't see how it would work. Concluding remarks from Gernot Wagner. You say you're agnostic about global warming up to I the am. point. Well, it turns out everything you've proposed today and everything you are proposing is pushing us exactly in one direction, <laughs> which is, well, a fairly strong language, which I guess would say over the cliff, but essentially is pushing us toward increasing emissions and making the problem worse. I'm for clean, abundant, and reliable energy too. I would just add clean, sorry, cheap, abundant, and reliable energy. I would add clean to this list. And it turns out there are several utility executives um, you know, G Jim Rogers from Duke Energy, for example, every time he talks about, 
his company, he talks about cheap, abundant, uh, in, this, in his case, cheap, reliable, and clean energy. So it's even utility executives who use the word clean. Um, why not add that to the calculus as well? If you are for market-based solutions, for making markets work better, um, let's do that. Let's decrease the rampant socialism of socializing costs of pollution. And also on the other side, um, decrease the fact that we socialize the benefits of R&D. Right? We all agree, or we both agree, that we ought to subsidize R&D, research and development. I would add deployment to that as well for the exact same reasons. There are things to be learned about how to deploy energy. That learning, that learning by doing, ought to be subsidized. And the starting point, of course, is if we want to mark, since we want to make markets work properly, is to do so in general. The biggest externality, the biggest market failure on this planet is global warming. Let's start there. Please join me in thanking Robert Bryce and Gernot Wagner. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.